This is what today's armed conflicts look like. A series of local actions, mainly inside the boundaries of one country. Most battles are fought by small units that hit and run. Sometimes they are supplied and supported by outside nations. It is a war of neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother, father against son. They are called by many names, these undeclared conflicts, rebellion, insurgency, terrorist activity. Revolution and national liberation. But whatever the name, they all have one thing in common. Men get killed, wounded, and captured. Now just what is the legal status of these prisoners who have been fighting their fellow citizens within the borders of their own country? Do they have any rights or protection against mistreatment? The time is 1949. The place, the Palace of Nations, Geneva, Switzerland. Here, 59 nations have met to create and set up an improved set of rules to provide a greater measure of protection for prisoners of war, wounded prisoners, non-combatant military personnel, and civilians not engaged in hostilities. Rules that have since been adopted by almost all nations of the world. As in all of the earlier conventions, most of the rules concern international warfare between two or more nations, such as World War II. Specific rules designed to prevent and prohibit inhumane and brutal treatment of prisoners of war, helpless civilians, and captive populations. Those who chose to disregard the conventions would be subject to prosecution at the end of hostilities. The precedents had already been set by the series of war crimes trials at the close of World War II, and the new conventions were designed to afford a greater measure of protection and humane treatment for prisoners of war and other helpless victims of the conflict. But what about the prisoners taken in the internal conflicts being fought today, where the action is contained within a nation's own boundaries? What protection have they? They have this. Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, an article common to each of the four Geneva Conventions of 1949. In the case of armed conflict, not of an international character, occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties, each party to the conflict shall be bound to apply, as a minimum, the following provisions. Persons taking no active part in the hostilities. Members of the armed forces who have laid down their arms and those placed out of combat by sickness, wounds, detention, or any other cause shall in all circumstances be treated humanely without any adverse distinction founded on race, color, religion, or faith, sex, birth, or wealth, or any similar criteria. To this end, certain acts are prohibited with respect to such persons. Violence to life and person, in particular murder of all kinds, mutilation, 
cruel treatment and torture. Taking of hostages. Outrages upon personal dignity. In particular, humiliating and degrading treatment. The passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court affording all judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized people. The wounded and sick shall be cared for and collected. An impartial humanitarian body such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, may offer its services to the parties to the conflict. The parties to the conflict should further endeavor to bring into force, by means of special agreements, all or part of the other provisions of the present convention. The application of the preceding provisions shall not affect the legal status of the parties to the conflict. Therefore, a rebel can be tried for treasonous conduct and other offenses against the local law. Just what have these rules to do with you? Today, throughout the world, United States Army personnel are assisting local governments in countering insurgency. Wherever you may be assigned to a counterinsurgency operation, you should make every effort to see that the Geneva Conventions are observed, not only because there is a duty to obey the law, but also because there are practical advantages to doing so. Some of these advantages will be shown later on. Section 7, FM 100-20, Field Service Regulations, Counterinsurgency, directs compliance with Article 3 and urges that the American military encourage others to do likewise. While the host government's forces usually do the actual capturing and interrogation of prisoners, you can and should urge the troops of the host country to accord prisoners the treatment specified by the convention. Encourage others to provide adequate first aid and medical care for their prisoners. Not just because you are obligated to do so, but also because it is possible that the insurgents may be influenced to follow the same example. When you discover that the insurgents have murdered or tortured their prisoners, or rounded up civilian hostages and killed wounded prisoners. Make sure that all of the evidence is carefully collected for use not only in the prosecution of the perpetrators, but also as evidence of the true character of the insurgent. This kind of evidence, together with eyewitness testimony and the depositions of some of the victims, may lead to the trial and conviction of those who are responsible for such acts. It makes no difference whether the victims are military or civilian. Inhumane treatment of any helpless person is a serious crime. And the guilty should be punished for their criminal acts. Although the insurgents may not feel obligated, they are still bound to live up to the rules of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. When the government of a country has ratified this pact, every citizen of that nation is bound by the rules of conduct set forth therein. These rules are observed not only because they are required and humanitarian, but also because such observance demonstrates to the world that the central government is a civilized and responsible agency qualified to conduct the affairs of the state it represents. Insurgents who know they will be treated humanely will not only be likely to surrender, but also may be encouraged to switch sides and support the legitimate government.
Some, like these former insurgents have, in fact, enlisted in the government army to fight against their former terrorist comrades. No matter how hard the fight before the capture of an insurgent stronghold, it must never provide an excuse for any mistreatment or summary punishment of the prisoners or civilians. The best way to show the people the basic difference between terrorist control of a territory and control by the legitimate government is to see that they get decent, humane treatment. Any type of mistreatment, real or imagined, gives the insurgent a strong propaganda weapon, one that weakens the support of the people and prolongs the struggle, affording the insurgents another excuse for more and worse atrocities. Brutality brings on more brutality. These are savage little wars. The insurgents are in many cases more vicious than any enemy encountered during World War II or in Korea. They resort to weapons and techniques that are outlawed or rarely encountered in international conflict. Does this mean that you will be at a disadvantage or held back if you observe Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions? No. As long as the enemy continues to fight, you can hit him with every legitimate weapon in the book. Every effort should be applied, political, economic, and military in order to bring the conflict to a successful conclusion. It is only for the protection of prisoners, the sick and wounded, and the non-combatant civilians that Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions applies. International law prohibits the following. Murder, torture, cruel treatment of prisoners, or taking hostages. Humiliating or degrading treatment of prisoners. Illegal sentencing and execution of prisoners without a fair trial by a regularly constituted court. There is no clean, quick, or easy way to win these wars. We are pitted against an enemy dedicated to the destruction of every free form of government in the world. Theirs is a technique of terror and enslavement. Respecting no rights. Obeying no rules. Right now you are being watched by the world. You are helping young and developing nations resist anarchy, tyranny and slavery. By providing all types of assistance to the local government in its fight against an insidious foe. By knowing and applying Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, and whenever possible convincing others to do the same, you also further the objectives of the local government. You therefore will be accomplishing your mission and will bring credit to your profession as a soldier in the United States Army.